So you have already, by reading ahead, passed G8. How dare? You don't know I read ahead. Uh, you explicitly told me that you've read to 307. 308. Uh, you read another one? I <laughs> You read another one since last time? In my defense, I had just fallen from heaven, and I was in a bit of a funk. And so, uh -huh. uh, I needed to stretch my legs. Oh, of course. And <laughs> so I walked around for a while, um, on a long, long land. Anyway, I just, I felt Look, guys, cramped. I'm not shocked she read ahead. I'm shocked she read ahead again in the hour since we last spoke. So we have the incredibly tense stare down at where we've left off, where the survivors and the survival game are staring at Anaru and just saying, no, you know what? We're not going to bow down to the Kami. We're going to try to fight you. Even though my man's made of lightning. What are you doing against an m, &M made of lightning? What do you do? Hmm. We already know. We were Bye. there. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, what everyone seems to do is croak. <laughs> they, what everyone does is their best. <laughs> they just do their best. And they hold hands. They braid each other's hair. And they're like, it doesn't look good for us. But, you know, you've been great. 274. I love that we start 274 in a flashback because we talked last time. It didn't really get into the YouTube. So if you only saw the YouTube last time, you'll be a little bit behind on that part. But that's okay. It'll be good. It's fine. Um about all the different colonialist kind of overtones in this and n not well hidden overtones. And so I really enjoy that our very first words going into 274 are, are we the evil ones? And that the original Kami is having this absolute breakdown and realizing like, holy crap, we might be the ones who are at fault here. And to have him start off the episode in that way is just wicked. So then we go back to Eminem sitting on his ball, staring at them all pointing down. We get to see the standoff from the other perspective and Nami being there and hidden. And then she learns for the first time that he is able to see her thoughts, feelings, ideas, and life. Yeah, so his mantra is like this next level thing and we really get a, a better view of it in this time we get into this arc that he uses his fruit to enhance his mantra because he's the static electricity all over skypea is his body because he is lightning so he is sensing from everywhere unlike asa who has this powerful mantra that can sense everything in a huge radius his radius is artificially extended by filling everything with him and that's so cool. Yeah, exactly. And then he lays down some information. He says the following thing. Listen, the roots of your conflict are much deeper than you know. Think about it. You are not clouds, but you were born in the sky. You are not birds, but you live in the sky. The foundation of this country in the sky is unnatural. Land is the place for land. Humans have a place for humans, and the Kami has a place for the Kami. Each has a place to which it must return. And okay. when I read that at first, I was like, oh, he's talking metaphorically about this idea and that idea, and about how these people think that they're allowed to rule the sky, but he's in the land of the gods, and therefore he has more power. But then later on, I started to think about it and connect it to other things, which we'll come back to in Corkboard Corner. But it reminded me when we were talking later and you were telling me about the Luffy giving the wink. Skypea feels exhausting, kind of like Jaya did, in that there's all of these things that I feel that the idea of Luffy giving the wink is kind of like, <laughs> I'm going to tell you so many things. <laughs> you're just right out in the open, but you're not necessarily <laughs> going to see it. By the end of this chapter in 274, he just randomly takes Robin down, which was a bit of shock. Get it? A bit shocking for Fantas. everyone. <laughs> um, and I think that was the perfect way to do it, because you think that Robin has this kind of ace in the hole with the, with the bell, and you're like, yeah, she set up all these things, and Robin is our super clever one, and then he's just like, oh, you, you think you fooled me? No, nah, I don't like you. Here, die. And just yeah. shocks her. We're all like, oh, oh. Because, you know, he's so built no different. Nonsense too. 
Yeah, and absolutely doesn't waste any time. And so within, like, no time at all, he's taking care of every single person. And then in true NAMI fashion, because somebody who spent her childhood locked away in a room writing and creating maps for one of the pirates, um, she does exactly what she should do and just is like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll come with you. Because she realizes that the very best way to save yourself is to live for now. Like she was taught that by her mom growing up. And then she yep. was taught that through her through her time being a prisoner and then becoming one of the crew. That the very best way is you just need to survive for now. You can't win in the end if you're dead. When we jump ahead later, and I'll come back in a second. When we jump ahead later and Nami is on the ship on Maxim and Luffy comes up and he looks at her and says, pull yourself together. You're a crew of the future King of the pirates. Don't embarrass yourself. And that kind of goes back into this, that idea that Nami for years had to wait for somebody to rescue her because she didn't just have her own ability to rescue herself. She was too young. She was alone. She didn't have a crew. And Luffy is reminding her, no, you're part of the fight. You're not sitting only and waiting to be rescued. You waited mm -hmm. for crew to show up. I'm here. Stand the hell up and fight. Yeah. And I really loved that because it kind of blends her arcs together and her backstory together. So I thought that was amazing. And I like the way that the backstory came in waves this time. Like we would be hanging out and all of a sudden through the misty clouds comes a backstory. And we get to see all these cool moments in time that goes back 800 years. The warriors of Shandora and those who sought to claim the stone fought in battle. Did we win? Yes, we won. Nothing is, I think more terrifying because I like to think about this in real life. You have wiper go up, use the reject button, actually God. stop his heart and kill him. He's God. laying on the ground. He's dead. Everyone is like, Oh my God, we did it. And all of a sudden you see, a lightning sizzling off in the corner and his body starts to convulse and everyone's like, Oh my God, what's going on? And then you hear bump, 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 bump. Oh, that, it is so scary, wildly cool. And, and this is something that I've said Oda does well before. And I think he just gets better and better at where you exit a fight and everyone has been hyped up. Like everyone is higher in your eyes than when the fight started. I don't know many writers who can manage that so consistently. As a bad guy, I think that he's pretty epic. Like I really enjoy him as a bad guy. Here's what I actually wish, wished occurred. I wished he didn't have any henchmen. I wish because common. of, yes, because of who he is and what he is like, fine. He uses and enslaves the people of Skypea. Um, he takes over some of the government. They can't fight against him. He is all powerful. But because of the level of all powerful he is, I think if he had had no henchmen, it would have been even cooler. And the idea of him being so powerful, he doesn't need henchmen. And Wiper, I like Wiper more and more the longer I read this chap this arc. Wiper is one of the greatest. He goes through a great big growth, very similar to his ancestor. And then immediately, doo -doo 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 -doo, we go back in time and get to hear the rest of the story that Wiper was told. Your ancestor was the great warrior Calgara, and he had more than one reason for wanting to take his take back his homeland. So all of, all of a sudden I was like, oh, what, what, what? And then they were jerks, and they moved right forward, and I got to go back into the battle again. But this is where Nami was like, my bad, I'll go. She even puts her hand up to the world of dreams. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can you, can you imagine if Eneru had been a little bit more transparent, Nami's reaction? <clears throat> I'll go to the world's dreams. That sounds great. Awesome. Let's get to the moon. Wait, what? What? Wait, what? What? <laughs> what? Are you Luffy finally managed to get himself out of the snack. I was like, my God, man. <laughs> okay. But uh, Hannes brings it in chapter 278. The chick comes in. And it was good in black and white, but the colors on her wave rider, when she burns in and runs over the white berets and just brings herself into the center to warn all the people of Skypea to get away and then stands in the middle and is like, you need to leave. You need to leave. And people are like, no, you can't do this. The Kamien Ru is planning on obliterating the island. And everyone's like, stop saying that. Uh, there's no way he'd hurt us. And then she stands in the middle. I don't accept Enru as a god. And then everyone's like, 
and the bravery of this girl and that's the whole thing that changes it and to have Enaru not be able to put his his uh, wrath on her in that he doesn't realize how important it would have been to take her down at that time mm-hmm. but instead because he sees her as being kind of insignificant and he has other things and he's busy bragging to Nami thinking about building his kingdom come like tell me all the Christian yeah. influence moments in those words and doing all these things so he doesn't realize that Connus can come in and disrupt all of his plans to decimate the people of Skypea. And she absolutely, completely flips what would have happened. Worth getting Luffy on the boat in 279 just for the panel of sad Eminem with his big ass face and his open mouth and his bulging eyes when he realizes that Luffy is probably his kryptonite. And once again, Oda does what Oda does where he gives the audience the thing they hope for. We and get to see some big punches here. Makes it feel so perfect. Yeah, because it at first he's like, well, so what if I can't electrocute you? I'm still intangible. You can't hit me. And the impact of the panel when Luffy uses the gum gum rifle and just blasts him. Ah! Oh, yeah, that's exactly. Genuine. So I told you originally that in my opinion, and we're going to get to the um, part, I think, coming up here where he goes, oh, I've got to be stupid. It's time for a gold star because you said that Luffy would be uh, Enaru's kryptonite. And I feel like because of rubber is obvious enough that I don't even want to give you a gold star. But you also mentioned that Mantra would be a problem and that Luffy being able to be stupid would be part of the kryptonite and gum gum airhead works. So I am going to give you a gold star because that part of the prediction is not easy. Once we learn that Luffy has to find a new way and he can't attack him in the same way that he's been attacking him anymore we go into chapter 282 and he decides you know what bud i'm gonna put your fist in some gold (laughs) can't can't punch if i melt a giant ball of gold and trap you in it and then roll him off the ship so that he crashes into the ground below that was really really well done and then Because Nami has already had that conversation with Luffy and she's learned, like, I have to stand up for myself, rather than just falling away and going into despair, this is where she starts to fight back. She says, there are a lot of things I want to do and a lot of things I want. But if I have to leave those guys behind to go with you, then I don't want it anymore. We need to have a Nami pause. Okay. Once upon a time, somebody, Uh it was me, Uh um, said that they felt that Nami was Uh in some way special. Yeah, and I said she is. She's very good at weather and maps. (laughs) And I said, stop saying that. So (laughs) Nami takes out her weapon. (laughs) Oh, my God. So Nami takes out her weapon that um, Usopp made for her. And I'll just have to take a chance and jump. If I stay here, I'm dead. Is there any way to battle lightning, she says in her head. And then because she is a weather witch or some sort of Nami thing, she creates a path for the lightning to go through with her weapon that Usopp gave her, which is, in my opinion, above and beyond regular people thinking. Like, she's still getting the gist of this weapon. she's smart and cool. No, there's more to it. So now we go back into it. Luffy is holding this huge gold sphere above his head. A very sun-like thing above his head. I will say, a giant golden orb does feel a little bit like it could be a... Some could theorize a representation of the sun. And then he is standing there with uh, the best little girl, Asa. And he says, Mm -hmm. oh... I can't get this stupid golden ball off. And she goes, don't say that. And I think she's saying, don't say that about calling it stupid, which is fascinating. It's her people's because it's a golden orb. And she's saying like, and so she's already giving it some sort of sacredness using her words, right? Like just kind of like a little bit of sacredness to it. And then I see what you're getting at. Yeah. You're saying that she is implying that there is a, 
spiritual level of meaning that we are, as the reader, are being instructed to attribute to this ball of gold. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So she's she's putting her culture's spirituality and importance on that ball. So we start to see it in a different light. I really like the idea. So Asa has instructed yeah. the audience to attribute a spiritual meaning to the golden ball. And so then when we go into chapter 284 and Sanji and Usopp are coming onto the ship and Sanji is off doing some great destruction on his own. And so Usopp and Nami are fighting the god on their own. I was thinking during this time that he came up here. His fear wasn't the thing that was in front of him in this fight, even though he's fighting significantly one of the most dangerous people that they've gone against. Well, his fear the most was dangerous. Yes. His fear wasn't the thing that came in first. He went right into bravery first and came in more straw hat like and boom, he immediately flips in and ew, 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 paper cut cuts between your fingernails and needle getting stuck beneath. <laughs> yeah, it was bleh, but wonderful. It, and it was kind it of great? a great fight. Wouldn't it be great if he starts saying all the gross things and describing all this? And Anaru goes, I have aphantasia, and just blasts him. <laughs> I also like the way that Sanji goes out here, where he gets blasted hard, and he goes, oh, there was just one more thing I wanted to say, but before that, thanks. I was just thinking how I wanted a light. <laughs> Such <laughs> a cool line. <laughs> Oh, Sanji showing up to be like, "Hey, it's been a while since I was the coolest person ever." Yeah, it's so good. And he's wrapped in band aids, and he's got only a partial cigarette since most of it has been fried away, and his entire body is smoking, and he's covered in scorch marks, and yet somehow still manages to pull off like the coolest Sanji look. And then he goes. And what is it you wanted to say? Oh, drop dead. And then he drops down. And you're like, well, it didn't work out well. And then immediately the ship starts to sink. Noise come out of everywhere. And he goes, what were you doing inside of the ship just now? And you're like, Sanji! Oh, high five, my friend. High and five, my friend. Time, Sanji tries to identify the end game and play for it. I think the reason that I thought this was like one of the most epic things is he does the thing. He actually starts to destroy the town. He brings the kingdom come down on it. Cause you're thinking the whole point of Luffy getting up there, I thought was to stop this. And you're like, no, he might actually take everything down. And he just starts absolutely decimating and destroying everything. This flashback. I mean, chat is come on. This is ugh, so many cries, so many cries here. When when we flash back, first of all, to Wiper being a young boy and listening to his chief, and he is taking this in in the way that sometimes when you talk to a kid, you have a time where you understand how important the words you're about to hear are, and you lean forward into them, and you take all of your little kid power to soak in the message and you can see his face. He goes, a dear friend. Yes. 400 years ago, he came and his name was, and then boom, we go right back in time and the city is falling apart and lightning is crashing down on the Varse, Mont Blanc, Noland, and things blow up. This is the tale from long, long ago. Let us travel back 400 years. That was done so beautifully. It made me get shivers. I was just like, oh, oh my God, I can't believe we're finally going to get to hear it. Just like next level awesome to have this cultural misunderstanding fixed, not in the nick of time. When Calgara has to run out into the ocean and scream and cry, we'll wait for you. Come back, my friend. You are welcome here. Noland. And then they both stand on the ships and cry at each other. Good God, now I'm wazzing again. 
We tick up the crying on stream counter to three. Oh, oh my poor eyeballs. <laughs> but that was so beautiful. They go back and it's clear that I mean, no one knows right away because he's been there before and he sees the house and it's split in half and he's just like devastated. And the king is like, why did you deceive me? And they beat him and he lays there on the ground where his friend should be, where an entire community of people are missing. And his heart is broken. What happened to the island? And then he says, Calcara. And just lays there bleeding on the ground. The Tell me that is he's not upset that they think he's a liar. He's not upset no. that he's losing face. He's no. worried his friend is dead. Yeah. Wazzing. Oh, so many tears. And then he has a public execution and they hire a person to lie and say that it was a bald face lie and absolutely decimate his character to the point that it becomes a story that is told to children for 400 years, Nolan the liar. And then we fast forward part of the way to the great warrior Calgara continued to shout, bring back the light of Shandora. Even once would have been fine if he believed that the sound of the light of Shandora would tell his friend Nolan everything tell him that they were right but that bell did not ring even once <sighs> it's a little bit brutal yeah i don't have words now now i'm sad you talk about nola <laughs> so while you <laughs> gather yourself i am going to read kaito luminous our beautiful mods they've done so much to help us speech about why they love nola I love Nola for a lot of reasons, but to fully appreciate him, I think it's best to start from the beginning with his backstory that is interlinked with Noland and Calgara. On the island of Jaya, we've only seen three giant snakes like Nola. Him, his father, his grandfather. After Grandpa Nola was killed by Noland and his father by Calgara's hand, only Nola remained as a baby snake orphan. Anyway, after his father died, Nola befriended Noland and Calgara with his sweet nature and love for the Golden Bell. The Shandians were even the ones that gave him the name of Nolan, naming him after Noland, the savior of the tribe. For a time, Nola lived in peace with the Shandians, not just as the child of their deceased god, but as a member of their tribe and dear friend. Everything changed when the majority of Jaya was sent flying into the sky via the knock stream, causing him to lose everything. The Golden Bell was lost, having been sent flying by Giant Jack and the Shandians being either killed or chased away from their homeland. This causes Nola, for the second time in his life, to lose everything and everyone he cared for. For the next 400 years, Nola would scour the upper yard in search of the golden bell that he loves and is the last connection to the friends he has. The sad truth is, the sad truth is, for those 400 years, he searched that island over and over again with the areas he could search becoming smaller and smaller every time he shed his skin becoming bigger. In fact, you could tell that he couldn't have even found the actual city of Shandor until the Straw Hats arrived, given the way he reacted to seeing the city for the first time in 400 years during the battle. Once he saw where he was, automatically started searching the area for anyone, his friends from the past, along with looking for the bell, every time he says Shalala, being his way of saying, where are you? Now, I know the One Piece community, they see Nola as a silly snake or just another character to glance over. But when I look at Nola, that's not what I see. I see a sweetheart of a snake that's lonelier than Laboon, having been alone and looking for his lost friends for over 400 years compared to Laboon's 50 years of waiting. He reminds me of Choo Choo, looking after his long lost treasure of the Golden Bell, which not only is a sound he loved, but his treasure, for that bell is the only thing he has left of his friends. Nola is a somewhat derpy, giant, venomous snake, but he's very lonely, kind-hearted, and gentle. Most of the time in the arc, being violent was either because Luffy was flailing around inside of him, causing him to thrash in pain, or him trying to protect his home from people fighting within it, uh, from destroying everything. He's a kind snake who craves company, even willing to let people party atop his head after the battle is over and remember his friends of the past, always trying to find his way back to them. So despite Nola be, not being remembered very fondly at all by the One Piece community, I feel is one of the most tragic and overlooked characters in the franchise who has combined the tragicness of Laboon and Choo Choo, two very beloved One Piece animals, and is one of my favorite animals in One Piece who even reminds me of myself waiting to wanting to hold on to something special that was shared between me and friends I've lost. Oh. Oh my God. Incredibly sweet and sad and almost has me tearing up. Thank you so much, Kaido, for that. 
I, I think that's a that is beautiful observations uh, about an animal who, yeah, most people see as just the silly snake. That just does not make me feel less sad now. <laughs> no, I'm I'm actually closer to tearing up after that than I was before. Yeah, that's yeah. crushing because as I was reading, I kept being like, this little tiny snake knows that each one of these men killed like it, two of its two of its snake people, mm-hmm. and and here it is just allowing and being coming part of a community. I was like, how much grace do you have to have to do that? So. Thank you so much for that. Thinking of that backstory so deeply, it just puts such a rich, um, such a deep, rich piece to this. It's it's one of those things that's so great about One Piece is that the story is so rich and deep that there can be a character who to most people you can gloss over, who if you look at closer, has so much depth and character and importance. And it's you can understand why most characters in the series might be someone's favorite because... There's so much hidden value and charm and depth and character to so many little pieces of this world. And getting to hear someone's take on one of the smaller bits, I always find so charming because you get to see something that you might have overlooked otherwise. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think that it's... It's a good um, amount of time to cut to. I think it could get to YouTube. I, it will. I will put that in. Yeah. YouTube. All right. Let's go fast forward to the future. Lightning is flying down all around everyone. And Rue is standing up there and can feel Luffy moving towards him, but just has no worry whatsoever. And lightning bolts, but only somehow takes off the top section. And Luffy starts to fall back down towards the ground. And boom, the top section of the beanstalk comes flying down. And Luffy grabs on and is keeping himself there. And he says, you just wait there and I'll show you something really interesting. And he begins to create another one of those giant kingdom come pieces. I love it. I love this part because Nami comes back and fights with Luffy. She is not running away from the fight. She is coming to the fight and she's demanding that I'm the only person who knows that this is here and can give Cricket peace. So I'll be damned if I'm going to go. And that is just incredible. All the crew, they... Ugh. Robin tells the whole backstory of Luffy and why he's trying to ring the golden bell and why it matters. And she says the coolest thing. He's a romantic. Even when things look hopeless, he would give up his chance to escape just for that. He's a bit crazy. And then she says, um, what is, what it, Wiper says, what is the name of his descendant? Mont Blanc Cricket. Then this ancestor from 400 years, his name must have been Nolan. And then Wiper starts to cry. Thanks a lot, Wiper. I just got my stuff together. (laughs) It's so beautiful. I think Robin immediately understands Luffy as a person better than most people. Yeah, I agree. I really do agree. The moment where Luffy convinced Robin not to give up and to fight to live and it made Robin want to follow him and join the crew. I think in that, in that instance, Robin saw deeply who Luffy really was all at once. Yeah. And that's what we see here in her reaction of, of course he would. That's, that's our captain. That's That's who he is. That's, That's who we got. I love that. It takes everybody that, Nola, that Wiper twice, that Zoro, that everybody has to come together to make it fall. And then Luffy understands how precious and how difficult it must have been. Like, he's just waiting for it to happen. Mm-hmm. But, he, but he understands how deep and precious it is. And so, because of that, he says, you know, we're not going to miss this opportunity. Give it everything you got she presses and starts to take them up because they realize she's their best hope because obviously Luffy's not going to ride the wave rider. And all of a sudden, Enru goes, I'm sick of waiting. I've just had it with you people. Kingdom come. And everyone is down there waiting on their boats. 
staring up at the sky without any hope for themselves, no way to control or do everything. And then Nami says, Luffy, not there. That's a whirlpool of wind and lightning. There's no telling what will happen to you. And Luffy says, yeah, no, I think I'll do this anyways. Gum, gum, fireworks. And then one of my very favorite, and I almost had you draw this one. This was one of the things that I thought was so powerful. Golden peony. And you just see his rubber arm flying in every direction with the golden ball on the end. And, And that moment you realize Enru gave Luffy the tools he needed to defeat him. Mm-hmm. By putting his hand inside of the gold, Luffy was able to clear the, yeah, like this person says, Red Potter, to, potato, to clear the sky. And so it's, you're just like, yeah, dude, thanks for giving me the tools I needed. Now, here we go. Um, so before it can go, the, this one has so many panels with such great dialogue, this arc. I've never it's felt like I needed to dialogue. read more. Just such good dialogue. Um, and, and like, because they, It feels like two different types of dialogue we're getting the peak of, which are like dramatic, epic fantasy. But also, there is really good just like 80s action film dialogue. Yes. Uh, on that, every... On that note, I, I, I want to go backwards for a second. Like when you talked about Wiper crying, hearing about Calgara, can you think about how affirming it is to be told you have inherited a 400 year old promise. You represent a person who promised to meet their friend 400 years ago. And we have no idea that person exists. We don't know if, if his legacy has carried on and it hasn't, his legacy is destroyed. And yet he gets to find out that another person has carried on the other side of that promise for 400 years, that there is another person and that the thing driving the hero who's running to save him right now is wanting to help them achieve that promise, wanting to help the two of them live up to a 400 year old oath they carry. It's so absolutely. And um, to add to that, he did know that that there had that Nolan's um, legacy had carried on in a negative way because the mm. chief told him, You're however right. many years when Gold D. Roger came up, um, that he had told him that he about Nolan the liar and how um, even though Nolan went to the gals to die and died standing behind um, the name of Shandora, that they used him as an example of lies. And so he knows that all these years, the promise was broken. He's the one who has been left to fulfill it from his ancestor. And that down on the earth, his reputation is absolute dirt. And yet then he finds out that there is somebody who is still fighting from his ancestry to have the truth and to restore his reputation. That must be insane to feel those feels. Someone else is carrying a 400 year old promise, even yeah. though it just like you, even though it's killing them, even though it is destroying them in body and mind to carry it the same way it has for you. Someone else is carrying that promise with them. That's so yeah. beautiful. When humans are made to stand at the edge of the abyss of death, what else is there for them to do but pray? And then everyone the next time we hear the song of the island again, the fighting will stop. Listen, Susu, do you think the gods exist? If they did, do you think they'd save us? And then she falls to her knees. Please, if you really exist, please protect those people. And then everyone, there's the amazing panel of everyone down on their knees. Give us a miracle. Gods, please protect this country. And everybody is sitting in there and then boom the panel flips over and they say please protect this country god and then full panel of luffy in the middle of a cleared sky with the black dissipating the gold ball in the middle and screams out let the sun shine we'll come back to that yeah something tells me based off of your theory you might find some sort of uh, evidence in a country of people begging gods to save them, cutting to Luffy, first of all, in this chapter, saying let the sun shine and going for a big punch. And in the next chapter, 
expressing immediately the thought, what good is a God who can't save his people? Exactly. So, so I feel like you are looking for evidence that Luffy might be a sun God as you are. Well, this might my, look something like evidence. In my opinion, this entire damn thing was, it was like, Hey, here's some evidence. Here's some more evidence. Mm -hmm. The ball of storm clouds has disappeared. What happened? Luffy says him and then oh god dang he it does, i couldn't i he does make the I, sunshine as people are praying for gods to save them that's true i i do look down at this panel and what do we have here wiper down on his knees because he knows the truth bring it straw hat ring the light of shandora and then luffy one after another winds up his arm into the greatest punch he goes 200 million volts and then he tries to stop Luffy, sticks the thing through him. And then Luffy is like, you've underestimated me, dude. Rewinds up his arm. Rocket! Gum gum rocket! Are you going to use the same thing? You bet I am. Until I reach. Gum gum reach! And then right there from in your drawing, boom, his hand goes through the top of the ship, out onto the bell. Smash! The sound rallies across the sky. El Dorado was in the sky. Ah, oh, so good. So good. Can you hear that diamond head, old guy? Can you hear it, monkeys? And it rings out for everyone to hear as it falls. And all of the compass birds immediately start flying out to the sound. We found it. El Dorado is real. And you get to see every single person's deep emotions all the way across we kept you waiting for so long i hope it reaches your descendant and then the greatest good snake nola crying and crying and crying and reaching up -la -la. ah this chapter okay. you know what it should have been called I joy I want to express a beautiful comment from chat from Red Sheena. Uh, Nolan and Calgara may have never met again since they departed, but because the bell is meant to guide their ancestors home, they hope that they got to meet again once the bell was rung. Ah! You're terrible. It's very beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, that killed me too. Emotional damage. This chapter is joy. This this two ninety nine. I felt like I had so many joy tears. And then we go down to the earth, and we get to see Cricket stare up. And the very first thing he says isn't about him, and that's something that made this incredible. The very first thing out of Cricket's mouth when he hears the bell ring is, now that's a great adventure. <laughs> it's very beautiful. And then we find out that, yep, just like I thought, it was sun projecting through them. So I get a gold star for that. Uh, um, sure, yeah. Don't yeah, sure me. I get sure. a gold star. And then we gold see... <laughs> I see it right there, right beside the gold thing, and it looks amazing. And then we see Luffy jumping for joy right out in the sky. So, kid, El Dorado really was up there. Thank you. And then he bawls, and he goes, those glad He goes, what what's wrong? What's the matter? Are you feeling sick, boss? Those guys. I'm so glad they're okay. Oh, Cricket, you're such a good kid. Oh. Yep. I hate this chapter. <laughs> but I love it. I just love this chapter so much and I hate it so much. People are trolling in chat. Uh, yeah, I've, I've oh, seen Kaido deleting some stuff. Don't, don't worry. Oh, someone did say Skype is filler though, right? Because uh, as a comment to the fact that some people say to skip it. No, how could you? Come on, listen to this. Um, no. Let, let Mama Jock serenade you about the beauty of Skype. Yeah. I have loved this arc with my whole heart. I have loved, I loved when Asia got her 
Her Asa got her um, bag of Vars treasure back. I love watching all of the Skypeans walking onto the upper yard. I love watching all of the Shandians coming from the forest to walk in. Um, their healing wiper. I like watching people's attitudes are changing. Are you sympathizing with him? Yeah, I am. I don't think you understand. And then out comes the greatest good boy, Chopper. Mr. Raccoon, I'm a reindeer. Look, horns. Um, <laughs> and all of the amazing things that happen. Um, and Robin leading them to get themselves some dials rather than gold, because that's going to be the thing that's going to be worth the most in the end. And it's just one great thing after another. And finding out that all of the Cammy's original people are still alive and that um, Connus's dad is still alive. Like, ugh. I do love that because his death scene was played so straight and, and cold, the Straw Hats being mad at him being alive. Like, we mourned you. Yeah. What and do you mean? He's like, and then he's so sorry for being alive. <laughs> yeah. Great bit. So then, oh yeah, that uh, it's so romantic, not going down and telling him, but ringing the bell. I agree. It, it really fits with that idea that Robin says, like, I didn't think about Luffy as being a romantic character until Robin said it. I mean, and then I a reason the first chapter is called Romance Dawn. Yeah, I know. And I, and I agree, but it still was amazing to me because even though the first chapter was called Romance Dawn, it's the idea of a romantic voyage, a romantic adventure, yeah. da, 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 da. But it wasn't until Robin called Luffy himself romantic. And I, I like being surprised. So I thought like, exactly, Robin, that's the exact right word for it. I also enjoy for me that when he takes Maxim off, he goes to the great endless verse in the sky, which he says to the divine world that floats brilliantly in the night, which makes me think that the moon might be a place of many gods. Yeah, so even though I saw the moon as being a place of a singular god, I think now that he's going there and calls it a divine world, that that makes me feel like it's a place of many, many gods. It is the last two chapters. We find out that Robin can read this. And then because um, I think what Oda was thinking is that this arc hadn't been very emotional. And so he wanted to add some emotion. Yeah, uh, so it, it's definitely pretty pretty light on the emotion. This arc, it was it was pretty basic, and so he wanted to have a moment where he um, had Robin read out the glyphs and release the Shandians from their four hundred year um, time of guarding the Pong glyph, and let them know that they no longer had to stand guard for it, which. Then the chief starts crying and crying and they get to feel what it feels like to actually finish a quest. What a great way to get to end. But more importantly for us, the ancient weapon that bears the name of God, Poseidon, its location, an ancient weapon. Why does it talk about something like that? Ugh, another weapon, a different one from the Pluton in the Alabasta. To think that such dangerous things continue to sleep in this world even now. All right, well, I don't want to know things like this. Uh And that's when I said, okay, good. Robin is a good kid. Sub on YouTube. Get us to 50,000 subs, and I will dye my hair to look like Marco for the arc where he is first relevant if we get there in time. I'll do full cosplay. I'm going to, it's going to be great. Hi, everyone in YouTube land. Can everyone in our chat wave to YouTube? Hi, everyone in YouTube land. It's me, Mama Drock. You'll recognize me from such places as here and nowhere else because you don't know me. Um, (laughs) But if you are here and you like what we're doing, please press the like button because it makes me sad when you don't because I see that you watched and you didn't press like and I'm like, they didn't like it. (laughs) And then I cry. And then people put up the crying emoji. (laughs) Uh, Don't forget that when you subscribe so that he can 
Drock can get himself looking like Marco, and more importantly, then I can decide to do a family picture time so that he has to have family portraits done that memorialize him for all eternity as a pineapple, I think, that um, you will be it's a part context. of making that happen. <laughs> it's on context clues, given that somebody said he looked like pineapple head. So then he will be a pineapple head for all time in our family photo, and I know you want that. Take that power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to reiterate for people who weren't here earlier, I did say that I was okay telling her that the character is Marco because I'm going to keep saying the character anyways, and I think being more direct is better, especially because it's not a sport. There's a thousand named characters in this series, well over that. I feel like it's not a spoiler that one of them is named Marco. I'm going over to my page of things that I said. Oh, good. I printed it in the lightest color I could. That was genius. Holy crap, I forgot about this. Okay, I got to get into it because <laughs> there's a lot of... I forgot how many parts there were to this theory because I went on a rant and then you. I was like, what did I say? And you were like, okay, good to, God. I had to like narrate back to Mama Drock what she said in this rant because she forgot how all the points connected. And I was like, okay, here's what you just said. <laughs> so I still believe that Chandia was purposely put up in the sky. The reason that I do is that there is a whole bunch of things that kind of make it feel like this had to happen because somebody determined it was going to happen. So we already knew that there was a knockup because we talk about there being pieces of Vars that are inside of Skypea and they've been using it. But then Eneru makes this point of saying, which we talked about in chapter 274, that um, you don't belong here. This isn't where you belong. Your story goes back much further than you think. And that this is not where you should be. The land is where the land belongs. People belong down there. Gods belong in this area. So he already tells them, your story goes back much longer than you think. You just don't remember the beginning of it. Now, an interesting thing there is that you then remember that both the Skypeans and the Shandians have wings, different, but wings. And so then I was thinking about how in the story, when Calgara is talking to Noland, he's saying things like um, this area, he takes him to the special area that is the city of gold. And he's like, this area, he doesn't say was ours. He says it was like ancestors. He takes him to an area that didn't belong to them, but that they are protecting. And then he purposely says they died and they were taken to heaven and we ring this bell to let them know that we are still doing the, the work that they needed to do because there was a great war over this bell. And so I believe that the people of Skypea were first taken up to the sky many, many, many generations ago. So like 800 years ago, they were taken up to the sky because it was during the time just before when we were having the um, void century. And so they were put in the sky so that they couldn't, um, A, ring the bell, B, have the pong glyph down on Earth because it was dangerous. And they are the ones that held the information. So by sending them up to the sky, you got rid of the problem and you no longer had to worry about it. But then many, many years later, 400 years later, along comes Nolan. Nolan rolls up to the shore, makes friends. They're talking about the thing. He tells them all about how his ancestors who have been taken to heaven, and they are because they're in frickin' heaven, it said, heaven's gate. He says died. I think that it might not be a death, rather. I mean, are they dead? A, a, death, who knows? Of a, a death of a people, maybe. But or I think it's more of a death of a people or a culture. Yeah. And so they are in this type of place, this heaven. And then Nolan comes and he says, um, oh my God, I can't believe this. He goes back and he starts talking about this great place that he went to, which was Shangri-La. And he, he tells all the stories and of the great bell and of the sound. And then, boom, people are like, oh, you have to take us there. You have to take us to the, where the gold is. And I think the powers that be or the people who hold the information or the gods or whatever it is, um, that originally put the Skypeans up there were like, no, screw this. We didn't know that all this time that the Shandians came and did the work of the Skypeans and are still protecting this area and that all of this is still remembered. We can't have that. Whoosh. They put the knock up right underneath that section of Jaya and take it up to the sky where it becomes Vars. 
And so when it becomes um, varse at the top, you have the difference between the, the reason that you have the difference between the Skypeans and the Shandians is because they were, they were ancestors of each other, but they're not exactly from the same nations. So they're similar but different, which makes mm-hmm. the whole idea around colonialism that much more powerful because they're, they both originally came from the same place, but now they've been separated by this space of time. Um, I'm just going back to my notes. Sorry. We're still protecting the home. Yeah. And so they get rid of this thing and then they don't destroy it. And how do you know one of the other reasons that might be true is that then a beanstalk from the Skypea area, and you'll notice in other images of Skypea, beanstalks are used kind of on either side of clouds and other pieces as a way of um, holding different roads together or different paths that boats can take or rivers. They kind of use it as edging. So uh, the beanstalks are a thing that's in use up there and one of the few things that grows. And then a huge beanstalk is grown right through that separates it into layers so that you have the upper yard where the Shandians were before they were taken out by the Skypeans who had the battles um, up in Skypea, but then the part with the bell, even though they separate the old city of Shangri-La from the upper yard, the bell is whoosh, taken right to the top and made so the pont glyph can't be seen by anyone. So you've both separated the city of um, the gold city and then you've separated the bell even to a further part, which shows that that's super intentional. So in my opinion, all of the Skypeans and the Shandians used to both live down in that area. And it wasn't there. It wasn't the Shandians necessary area, the city of gold. It was what later became the Skypeans. So they literally were taken to heaven. And so all these years they've been ringing the bell, which the Skypeans probably would have heard because we know that the bell could be heard from heaven to earth as Luffy showed us. Um. Now, let me look. Yeah, there was a step that went even further beyond. I'm just looking. Uh, Then the government realized. So, oh, right. So then in order to make sure that nobody believes this story and nobody thinks that they ever existed, they they think of this, the Golden City as being... Um, nothing but a child story. They turn it into a child story. They make it a mockery, which is something we do even in modern times by hauling things down, making a joke out of them um, and um, making them seem silly. We make people take things that are serious, less serious. So suddenly you make children's books called Nolan the Liar. You make Nolan a cautionary tale of a person who's a liar who makes up ridiculous stories that could never be believed by people. But instead, what you're doing is covering up the great mystery of the disappearance of an entire section of land and of two groups of people and stick them up into the clouds. Yeah. Is that where I was? Did I have anything else that I said? Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you give me a hint? Because I'm looking at my words. I've written so many things. Uh, multiple bells or other instruments. And the oh, reason right. Why thank you. Be thank destroyed. you. Thank you. Okay. So you can't destroy the bell, right? So a person who's thinking might say to themselves, well, that's ridiculous. Why not just destroy the damn pond cliff and the bell? But you can't. Because like Robin has discovered, the ponkliffs all have to be connected. And the bell clearly does more than just ring and tell people that they are keeping the things alive. That's ridiculous. Because um, the bell is obviously important and might be needed to use in the future. Does it set off um, all the weapons? Does it help to combine information? Is it possible? Because in one of the lines later on inside of there, um, it actually says... And the bell could be heard across the oceans far and wide, deep, deep into the sea. And so when they said that, I was like, well, for sure, then, if you have a bell whose reverberations are felt around the sea, because they literally say that in the story, and it's just one little um, panel. Oh, I took a picture of it, like a smart kid. 
um, then it would make sense then that that bell ends up becoming important later on when we are connecting things together and we're when we're in laugh town and we're at the end maybe there are multiple instruments that all have to ring or be done at the exact same time maybe there is the bell is the instrument and then there's other things that have to happen in order to create a chain of events that unlock and allow the one piece to be found or have access to it but he says there is a dark shadow over the land you, um, you gotta specify chief. who he is we're, we're, you're, the, you're, the you're, chief the chief in Shandian says there is a dark shadow below over the land um, whose whose histories are being told up here and I'll find the page of it the picture of it in a minute um, so then that made me say like, okay, for sure then that this bell is going to end up having a place later on in the discovering of the one piece, but also it could, it, I think it could be used in a couple of different ways. And it might be that it is also um, a possibility of there being danger or it's something that bell and the sound of the bell and some other things are the only thing that can save you if these large weapons are used because we're putting the weapons together with this bell yeah before right. being able to go back to the grand line nolan's home country get jurisdiction from the world government assumedly they had to explain that they why they would be going yes exactly yes when i read that i they was like to get rid yes. of it and make a mockery of him because if they don't yes they, their country oh my god you're right otherwise why would you yes. need to point out in the that's story what that i was they saying permission? So and they yes. sent to the world government that they were going, letting the world government know, oh, heads So up, now the world government Shandians knows what's exist. taking place. The city of gold is still there. Oh, yes. what? that does corroborate. Yeah. Thank you for uh, Ron Quixote Dill for... <laughs> I couldn't say that name with a straight face. Thank you, Ron Quixote Dill, for a really good point to corroborate this theory. So it says the journey of the slumbering floating island was long, but its distant memories were hard to forget. But its distant memories were hard to forget. Uh, Once its people yeah. entrusted words to the sound of the bell. Once its people entrusted words to the sound of that bell. They believed in the power of the bell to carry the song to the furthest reaches of the sea. Okay, next time. So I know that one was a bit up there in the crazy world. I but This is one of my favorite theory rants from you. I, I think that was great. Yeah, I really think if Nolan was called a liar, he would have started a gold rush to find the city of gold. What did Roger do? He started a pirate era to find the treasure. The Nolan conspiracy goes deeper. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. And that's what I was saying. So unlike Nolan, he says the thing is there, they kill him, et cetera, et cetera. And then meanwhile, um, you've got Goldie Roger, who was also killed because he got too damn close to the truth. Why are you killing the Pirate King? Because if you think about it, they're, they're, they're not, no, they're not killing the other seven pirates who are all warlord those, pirates. Those are government approved pirates. Those are sanctioned pirates. Precisely. And why don't they sanction the king of the pirates. That would be ridiculous because if you had the king of the pirates sanctioned, then the king of the pirates would have way more control over the other pirates. That just makes sense. That's so true. why do you kill? Why do you kill somebody who is the damn king of the pirates? Well, because he's way too close to the mystery and he's way too close to revealing what you are trying to keep hidden. He also writes it in an ancient lost language. So that, clearly, this yeah. dude as far is as we know, Robin's way more the only likely one who can read. Yeah. Like the Shandians can't read it, Robin can. That's and sh that's important enough that Crocodile kept around a person he didn't particularly trust or like just for that ability. So clearly, it's rare. I think that's why Goldie Roger was killed. He was. He knows what the One Piece was. He knows what the missing time is, and therefore, what does he do? He decides no. It's time say. to get the truth out there. You have to admit that you're never going to sound more like a crazy person in front of a corkboard than when you say, why did the government kill the world's most famous criminal? He was too close to the truth. It's the only I, thing that makes sense. Nothing else would explain why they're going to kill the most famous criminal alive. I don't care. I'm right. right. And even when I'm wrong, I'm right. I loved it. I love it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> too close to the truth, I tells you. 
He's getting too close to the truth. It's time to kill him. He's over 9,000. I don't think we have any new devil fruits, but do you want to... I'm not done. You have have more corkboard. Okay, never mind. (laughs) This area was called... um, Mama Drock no longer has to prove that Luffy is a sun king. God. Sun king? Okay. Sun god. Um, Because... In this chapter, one place after another, they put him inside a golden orb. They had him, they had a mazillion different little hints and ways. Like that I found, and he I did, looked at my he phone. He did clear a stormy sky, making it sunny, using a giant I'm golden orb. As people so, prayed for salvation from a god. That I happened. found a million little places where they just gave one panel hints. And then all of a sudden, there were like many panel pages of people just being on their knees and being like, dear gods, please save us. And then Luffy bringing the sun into the center of evil and dispelling evil. And then everyone said, let the sun shine. I swear to God, if Oda could go back in time, he would say to himself, my bad, I'm going to take this panel out. Um, (laughs) because I think it just, if you're reading it for the purpose that I am, that's indefutable. I think sun God, I think you should already have to give me a evidence, not proof. Proof and evidence are very different. Getting an EMF meter to go off in a haunted house is evidence. It's not, do not argue with me about proof and evidence. I'm, I study history. Uh I don't care. I think that it's, (laughs) 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 what kind of is that? (laughs) <laughs> I don't care. I'm mantraing this. That's all I got to tell you. Is there a stowaway again on the Mary? Okay. We had that child Usopp saw out in the world, and we've had no more information about it or anything. And I wanted the next person to be a boat fixer. And then Luffy does announce once they're down in the ocean that they are going to find somebody who's a shipwright. And I was like, yeah. That's a good idea. But then I was like, um, dude, is there already somebody on your boat who is a shipwright? Um, yeah, prediction. There is a stowaway on the boat. Okay. Uh, next one. We're going to go to a country of dwarves, not just little people. Now we're just going to go to one that is a country of dwarves. Okay. Nolan said in his story, when he went back to his own land, people asked them to tell stories of his time. Mm-hmm. And he talked about being in a country of dwarves. All right. Add it on. There is a shadow of darkness over the land beneath whose history we hold. I was like, what, what is the dark shadow? A dark shadow implies that we think we're living within a regular system of bureaucracy etc etc down on the earth but it could be being directed by something darker that people are unaware of because when he says there's a shadow of darkness that implies that we are missing something we are missing um who might be like puppeting um who might be taking over and people don't know they are being puppeted you know what i mean Whatever the shadow of darkness is, is the thing that created the void century. That's as far as I'm willing to go right now okay. because I need to collect. As a separate thing, in a, I'm just putting this out there. I know you pedal goes up me, but I don't want to not say it because it's just a thing I want my mind to focus on every once in a while. Okay. Is that there could there could be an idea of the one piece being a land that has been tucked away in shadow and darkness with people don't even know it exists. And it could be anything. From a heaven, um, gods that have been imprisoned, to a land of um, people that have been imprisoned that we don't hear about. The way that we didn't know about the Skypeans or the Shandians being um, brought up. So I thought it would be very interesting if the land and darkness and shadow that he was talking about and the great history was a missing group, of a, a missing people or a missing land. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Um, the, is this the one piece? Maybe not, but definitely it could be. What if there was a whole section of gods or people or something that were trapped in darkness and shadow? Yeah. This drawing, P.S., somebody was just like, I love the drawing drug. So I meant to say this a long time ago. This drawing is incredible. Thank it you. couldn't be better. It absolutely couldn't be better. I didn't it didn't get f- enough dynamism in Luffy's pose, but otherwise I like it. No, don't be ridiculous. Are we cutting it off now or are we doing a live read? I don't want to take up people's time if they actually have things to do. How do people think about this as a compromise? Okay. 
I have a long-term project I've been working on. We wrap up Skypea, and then Mama Drock can do a live read of however many chapters she wants after Skypea, starting at 3.04, while I work on my long-term project a little bit. I'll just be dabbling away, and people can stick around and listen. Yeah. Man, someone said the best One Piece analysis, and I really want to quickly say, I am good at media analysis. It's a thing I am genuinely very good at, and I have always thought that if I made a YouTube channel, I would be one of the better One Piece analysts. What I didn't expect was to make a YouTube channel where my mom became a, like the star of the show and is so good at analysis of my favorite series that I'm like, okay, I am a very good analyst making a show with probably the future best analyst in the community. Oh my God, that, no, come that was, on. I, I think the only person I would say is your competition is Ohara Otter. And that's the guy who's like learned Japanese to solve the One Piece. Yeah, no, no. You, yeah. you, when you cook, man, you... No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Don't get me wrong. I'm very good at media analysis. Me saying you're better than me is not putting myself down. It's just, yeah. it's just a statement of the facts. You're doing an incredible job. You're getting so much out of this series, and I've loved to be part of it. I'm so grateful I get to. Oh, oh I, we I will, but we, got to, we haven't done top five characters. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, YouTube. And I'm so sorry, people oh, here. No, no, YouTube didn't get anything. I, I skipped forwards. YouTube missed all that. Oh yeah, never mind. You know what, YouTube? Quit complaining. Um, <laughs> uh, top so, people this time. Top characters. Starting with number four. And I just literally saw it on my head go, ding. Okay. Um, and then I saw you put down weird things. Number okay. four... <laughs> I find number four easier for some reason than other ones because you're not last, but you're in the bottom half. <laughs> I, I cannot decipher the order you choose for these. It's different every time. It's great. <laughs> okay. Number four, my person who I would say um, is going to be Connus this time. She was in my number four right away. I thought about her. She, she was equally responsible for keeping people safe in the way that other people were. I have a number one already. Okay, we look, we can just do it. Pull the trigger. Okay. Trigger. Oh yeah, no, no, bite me. It is. It's number one. Oh, ah. yeah. I am gonna do a split screen on this one. All right. We're allowed two people if I feel like they, they are a pair enough that it makes sense. Okay, it's four. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> Four people? You're putting four people? Okay. But can I can I tell you why? Can you stick well, with tell, me here? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't think you can tell me why. For me to for me to right now remodify my little top five characters thing in the editing app, I need you to just say the four characters, and I'm going to judge an instant if I can tell why they share a spot. And if it feels like it needs a stretch of an argument. We have to break this down. So okay. please go ahead and tell me the four characters sharing number one. Okay. I am going to put in um, Calgara and Noland uh -huh. as a shared spot. Uh -huh. And then as a shadow inside a parenthesis beside them as a shared spot with them in parentheses as a shadow to them. I want Cricket and Wiper to be there. Here's because the I see this is the only four I could see. I was yeah. thinking if it's not these four, I am not letting you have four characters in the same spot. But these four, yeah, go for it. This makes sense. Yeah. Um, and now let's go to number five. <laughs> of course. Okay. Uh, five is a little challenging. I'm just gonna number one, I just put promise buddies, just so you know. That's what in the edit that that section's called. It just says promise buddies. I'll allow that. That's good. I am making I am making two. Don't at me, Nola. Is it because of Kaido's speech? It didn't hurt. Number two should be Nola, and hear hear me on this. Nola okay. is the thing that is the. I can't believe I'm saying this, given the shape of a snake. But Nola is the thing that is a thread between the fun, past and fun. the present. Um, You're right. You're right about that. I am making number five enjoyment. Enjoyment. <laughs> Nami is number five. 
Nami, great. She's almost number three. Let me think, Nami. You are you're doing things that you haven't done before. You had all these big growth moments. You were Nami is three. Nami is number three now. Okay. <laughs> I I put the person the other person you hyped above Nami, but you know what? Not Nami did great. I understand it. You can just say it. Who gave me joy? This isn't a... The, the, I have seen you hype up Luffy a lot this arc. His leadership, oh, his trust in his shit. crew. His leadership. God dang it. Kept talking Sorry, Nami. Nami. Having Nami. an opportunity to run Nami. for safety and saying I need to ring that bell. The, I'm the only one oh. who can let him know that this exists. You know what the real problem with Luffy is? Is that I could honestly stick him in every every top five. Yes. Yeah, Sometimes I mean, I, He's great. <laughs> I, I Sometimes seen, I want to have a Luffy on the sand. I love this Noland being no land. It's so cool. Yeah, I move move Nami to five and put boom, Luffy boom. in three. Slap him up. Yes, my boy here, Monkey D winner. And I don't want to hear anybody's mouth piecing off in YouTube about how you talked me out of it. No. Sometimes when I'm in my universe, I need somebody to be like hey remember when you said these things because i don't i legitimately <laughs> don't remember Fair enough. <laughs> thank you so much everybody for being here you are always a blast to, to have around to talk to you are i watch enough twitch that i can say this is my favorite twitch chat that i've gotten the pleasure to be part of and getting that on this end is so special you guys are amazing oh, i need to say something about you guys on twitch um, you up my coolness level by volume you can't imagine. The other day, a kid <laughs> told me, a kid was like, you have Twitch? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, do you use it? And I was like, do I? And <laughs> I didn't tell them because I don't tell kids. They have to find it on their own. One kid found this channel on Reddit. Huh. Some, somebody was talking about it. And she's like, is this the thing that you're doing? Yeah. So I just got to say, you have no idea how cool you make me look. <laughs> 19 chapters, what we're reading next. We're reading from 303. Oh, it was three, the last one's okay. Reading from 303 to 321. The long ring, long uh -huh. long arc. And I will say again, I think if there's any arc that you can feel comfortable just like reading at a surface level and not needing to pull out your fine tooth comb and just getting to enjoy a pirate story, it's long ring, long land. Thank you guys so much. And YouTube, until next time, it's been lovely dropping to you. Can you show them the god over in the corner and yes. show okay. them? Okay, so something interesting. Renaissance portraiture, a common trope is having women pose with little uh, symbols to represent their holiness, their devoutness. They have religious uh, symbology. So I've assembled a few figures of gods to show how uh, holy she is, because I thought that was funny. And I said, you know what else would be funny is if you put my two good boys. No, stop. Don't in don't here. don't use the, don't use the power you have over the stream. She wants me to do Hi, hi chat. No. I was just thinking that you should tell him to put my two great big giants in there too, because Dorian Brogy, Dorian Brogy want to be a part of this. I you can't you can't don't do a poll about it. No, we should have a poll. <laughs> the giants. <laughs> giants poll. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, everyone from Mom Piece is gonna have to show up to my long-term project streams to remind me I'm supposed to. Otherwise, I'm probably going to forget. Democracy!